Hey everybody, it's Voltar here, and today we're going to be talking about retro video game scalers. Now, these are devices that are designed to process the video content of all of our old video game consoles that were produced prior to the HD era. So let's say anything between the Atari 2600 all the way up to the GameCube, PS2, Xbox, Dreamcast. These devices are designed to bring those video signals into the 21st century and into the digital video domain. Now, they're wonderful. Thank goodness. I think we're in the golden age of retro gaming simply because these devices are not only accessible now, but they're also affordable to the masses. Affordable, but not cheap. Now, make no mistake, the OSSC is worth every penny in value. The Retro Tink certainly is worth every penny in its value. These are great devices that really can't be replaced. But what if you don't have a hundred or a couple hundred dollars to throw in, or you're, you're just getting your feet wet and you're not sure you want to commit to real hardware, but you don't want to break the bank just to get started to see what you're thinking about in life. Do I want to go emulation? Do I want to stay hardware? You know, does retro RGB suck? These are all questions that are worth investigating without breaking the bank. So the question is, can we obtain a video processor that works pretty well with retro video games and not spend a fortune or remortgage our house? And the answer is yes, we absolutely can. And that's exactly what this device is. Now, Rama, who is an excellent, excellent, excellent member of our community, has really curated and made a custom firmware available for this big green device right here. This is a GBS. Now this GBS 8200 was primarily designed, I believe, for arcade vendors to repurpose cheaper LCD monitors into their video game cabinets without having to source what are currently now hard to find CRTs. Now this device on its own is a piece of crap. It processes everything as an interlaced signal and the latency is pretty significant, but Rama in his infinite wisdom and ability has produced a custom firmware that, oh my gosh, guys, makes this device amazing. You wouldn't believe the features. You have a fraction of a frame of latency. It outputs up to 1920 by 1080p resolution. It can downscale uh, resolution sources to 240p. That's really a big deal. And the output is quite, quite good. Excellent scaling algorithms used. Look at some of this footage. It looks pretty close, doesn't it? It's quite amazing. Where the GBS also really shines is its motion adaptive deinterlacer. Guys, this thing is remarkable. If you like, for example, the PlayStation 2, most of us know that most PS2 titles output only in 480i. Well, the GBS with the GBSC firmware is really the great, great, great pairing of pairs. This will give you motion adaptive deinterlacing that gives the PS2 a beautiful look. It far exceeds the OSSC and it certainly rivals the motion adaptive deinterlacing of the RetroTINK 5X. Just check this out. It's really, really nice. Now, super low latency, razor sharp output. It's really, really, really good. And also another nice thing about this, loss of sync between resolution changes is no longer a problem. Watch this. This is Chrono Cross. And as most of us know, the menu system in Chrono Cross is 480i. Watch the resolution change. It's amazing. No frame drops. An excellent, excellent video processor for any streamer out there who wants fast response, no resolution drops, and just great quality at a low price. Well, let's talk about price. Now, I use this device exclusively with HD RetroVision cables. Why? Because I've divorced myself from SCART for a number of reasons. Technologically, in this day and age, in my opinion, Nobody really makes a really good SCAR cable anymore, and that's just my personal opinion. I use Component because it's simpler, it's easier to interface, and it just works. 
Now, the question is, how much is this going to cost? Well, by the time you do all the little mods that we're going to do in this video, you're probably going to have less than 47 bucks. And a video processor that you can build yourself is packed with features, has Wi-Fi support, you can manipulate all the options and parameters through a web page that runs on this device. Guys, I have a lot of video processors and I do a lot of retro gaming content as you all know. I use this device probably just as much as any other. It's amazing and it's less than the cost of most... Ah, Jesus, I mean go buy a Switch game or go buy a video processor that will support all of your old retro video game consoles. It's up to you. At any rate, we're going to build this. Now, I'm not going to do the SCART stuff so much. We'll do the prep work on the board, but we're not going to be adding a SCART uh, connector to this. That's really easy to do, and as a matter of fact, you can just get a SCART to VGA um, pigtail cable that'll handle that, but we'll do all the prep work to get it ready for SCART. I'm only interested in component, and if you don't care about the SCART input, a lot of the little tweaks that we're going to be doing, you can just skip. As a matter of fact, I'll show you where to skip that from and to in the video because you don't need to do it. Let's build this, let's configure it, let's get it ready, and let's see where $47 can really take us in our retro gaming video processing endeavors. Sit back, strap on, let's do it. Now before we get started, let's go ahead and talk about some of the components that we're going to have to have in order to build this. Now I'm going to have Amazon links for most of the stuff, but by all means, if you can find a cheaper vendor elsewhere, use it. Get the best value for your money. Now we need a GBS mainboard, which is exactly what we have here. GBS 8200 series, pretty self-explanatory, hard to mess this part up. We're going to put this to the side. We're also going to need a way to load our custom firmware into that hardware. I like to use the Node MCU ESP8266. This is what's going to drive the custom firmware into the GBS as well as run a web server so that we can change all the options and parameters by the convenience of a cell phone, tablet, or computer. Very important to have. Now this is a signal generator and I think that this is totally mandatory even though the directions say it's optional. Basically, with sparing you all the jargon, guys, if you want to avoid screen tearing or any sort of seams or video artifacting in your video games, get this little cheap device. It provides a much more precise signal and it's available for the video processor to use and it just makes the timings much, much, much better. Get it. Now, if you're going to be interfacing this directly to a VGA or analog output, or should I say analog input, you don't need anything. VGA comes out, you connect this to a good LCD monitor or, an, or a computer monitor, whatever, it's going to work great. But let's say that your um, sync device only has HDMI. Well, things just got really easy because guess what? We have a lagless DAC right here. It's just going to transcode and digitize the analog video, bringing it into the digital domain, and it'll drive out HDMI. And it also has an embedded DAC. So you can go ahead and take your audio source, connect your audio into this, and you can drive both video and audio directly out to whatever device that you want to connect this to. Very easily done. Now we're going to need to do a few little mod modern hardware hacks to this GBS mainboard. I'm going to be using four 10 microfarad ceramic capacitors. I recommend 1206 or 0805 in size. Anything above 10 volts is perfectly fine. This is going to clean up the power rails on the GBS hardware and it'll clean up any signal noise that would otherwise probably be there. Now there's just one last thing here to talk about and that is a 100 ohm resistor that we'll be installing for composite sync if and only if you're going to be using a SCART input. If you're not going to be using SCART and you're only going to be using the component inputs, you don't have to do this. Now I'm going to be installing that and we'll also be doing all the SCART sort of prep work that'll make this compatible with any sort of SCART interfacing so you don't have to do that in the future. We'll cover that. But just know that I don't use the SCART input. I don't use the RGBS input, I should say. I only use the component. So unless you're going to be using SCART, you don't have to worry about bodging this resistor in. It doesn't matter. Now we've talked about everything that we need to have in order to do this. Before we get started on any of the physical mods, 
let's load up our Arduino package, links in the video description, and let's load the software into this module and compile GBSC so that it'll run on this and we can get all the software configurations out of the way so we can get straight to the modding. Okay guys, let's move to the computer and let's get it going. Now guys, the software stuff is truly a walk in the park. Just stay with me. You're going to get through this. Now let's just go ahead and download the Arduino IDE from Arduino's website. Let's get that installed. Once we have that installed, let's go to the GBSC Wiki software setup page and let's download the three required libraries that we have to import into Arduino in order for this to work. And finally, let's download the latest build of the GBSC control software. Let's download that folder and put it also on our desktop. Now, when we're at our desktop and we have all this done, we're going to take our three libraries right here that we extracted. I want to highlight them all and I want to just cut them. And you're going to navigate to the location where you installed Arduino. In my case, it's on my desktop. So I'm going to navigate into my Arduino directory. I'm going to drill into libraries. And in the libraries folder, I'm just going to paste those three library folders right in here. Now, since I've already done this, it's asking me if I want to replace them. This may take just a few seconds, but ultimately, this is the easiest way that I know of to get those libraries where they need to be without having to meddle around, meddle around in the software so much. So we'll give this just a second to finish up, and we'll keep going. Okay, we've got that done. Now, there's one thing here that you really want to do. When you extract the GBS directory folder from the GitHub on Rama's GitHub, we're going to have to rename this. We're going to have to rename this to just GBS hyphen control. You absolutely must remove the dash master. Just rename it to GBS dash control and you're all set. Okay, with all of this out of the way, let's go ahead and let's just launch our dildo. And when our dildo launches, we're just going to maximize this so we can see what we're doing. And the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to click File and Preferences because we have to include a special library. Right down here in Additional Boards Manager, copy and paste from the wiki this link. This will give us access to the ESP2866 board files that we'll have to have. Once you paste this in here, you're done. Now click Tools. And in Tools, you're going to see right here, Board. Now, there may be some generic board already populated. That doesn't matter. We're going to click Boards Manager. And from here, we're going to type in ESP8266. Give it just a moment to parse that. And once it does, we're going to highlight this. It's very important, guys, that you install a version that's less than 3.0 but greater than 2.63. Just do what I recommend. Install version 2.73. That's all you have to know. Click the drop down, select 2.73, click install. Now this will take just a few moments and it'll finally install and you're all ready to go. So we'll close this. Now there's only a few little parameters left that we have to modify. We're going to select tools and we're going to come back down to boards once again. Now we're going to highlight ESP8266. We just installed this. Now for our board that we're using, we're going to navigate all the way down, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, until you find Node MCU version 1.0. This is the module that we use and that I use. That's all you need to know. Highlight this. Once you collect that and you select it, you're going to have to drill back in here and you're going to have to change a few more things. CPU frequency. This is going to be set to 80 megahertz we need to set it to 160 megahertz. Once again, we have to drill back into it. Flash size, set this to 4 MB, file system 1 megabyte over the air. This is the correct option. Select it. Once again, we have to drill right back in here. The last thing that we need to make sure is selected is the IP variant. It just needs to be set to V2 lower memory, and it already is. Now, at this point, we're going to go ahead and we're going to take our module and we're going to connect it via USB to our computer and you'll hear the little USB sensing chime. Just like that. Okay, great. At this point, we're going to navigate all the way down to port. Whoops, sorry. Didn't mean to do that. We're going to, we're going to 
jump out of that and we're going to click right back in here into port and you'll see that it automatically detected that our device is selected and connected to COM10. We're done guys. That's all the configuration that's necessary. Now we're going to drill in to the actual ESP, uh, the GBSC files. And we're going to compile it. So you're just going to select the GBS control folder on your desktop and you're going to click GBS-control, the INO file. That's all you got to know. Double click on it, drill into it. It's going to open up a new window. The only thing we have to do now is compile this bad boy and upload it to our module that we still have connected via USB. And the way to do that is right up here. I'm just going to click upload. Now when I click upload, it's going to first compile it and then it's going to shoot it off and put it into memory on our device. It'll take a few minutes, but be patient. Let's do it. Great work, guys. We're all done with the software preparations. We can now disconnect the USB from our module and we can get right back to work on all of the fun mods to make this go. Let's do it. Okay guys, get your soldering irons ready. It's time to get to work. Now the first two things that we're going to start out with are totally optional. If you're not going to be using any sort of SCART interface with the GPS hardware, you don't have to do this. In other words, if you're only going to be using the component inputs, these two steps are not required and you can skip ahead. Having said that, we're going to remove these trim pots right here. These are attenuating the video and unfortunately they're not up to spec in terms of a 75 ohm impedance match termination. We can remedy this by simply removing these three pots and bridging across their connections. Let's flip it over, let's get our desoldering station out and let's just zip them out and strap these hard style. Let's do it. Now to make this process a little easier, I'm going to introduce some fresh solder. Now I'm doing that because these GBS boards typically use very, very, very crappy solder systems. So this is just going to make my job a little easier when it comes to desoldering this because I will be using a desoldering tool and I don't want to gunk up my desoldering station with cheap, lead-free, crap solder. So I'm going to lower the melting point temperature of all of this solder. And I'm also just going to dilute the chemistry a little bit here. It just makes my job so much easier and it will make it easier for you too. So just go ahead and wet in your own solder. It doesn't have to be nice. It doesn't have to be pretty. Let's just drop that melting temperature and let's get some good leaded solder in there. And as you can see by these joints, clearly this is all leaded solder. Doesn't wet very well. It's really nasty. You really need to do this. Okay. Let's get our desoldering pump in here and let's clear these joints. Okay, great. Now we're just going to flip this bad boy over and these pods should literally come out very, very easily. Perfect job. Now the only thing left to do is to bridge across these pots so we hardwire them and we'll be all set. Now the next part is pretty simple. I just have a pre-tinned 28 aug conductor here. I'm going to be feeding it through and bridging these off. Pretty simple, just watch me do it. Now I'm going to flip this over upside down just like this. Now to bridge off these three trim pots, it's nothing special. I just have a 28 aug conductor that I have pre-tinned up to keep it rigid and solid. I'm just going to feed this through and solder it in. Watch me. Let's flip this upside down. Let's begin by feeding this through. And once we feed it through, it's really simple. I'm just going to take something like a pair of tweezers. And I'm going to bend this down just like so. And I'm going to feed that other end of our open conductor right through that plated through hole just like that. And look at that. The only thing left is to solder this in place. Let's zoom in and let's get a good shot of that. Great work. Okay, we're done with this part. The only thing remaining is a small 100 ohm resistor that we need to add to the sink line to make the sink source for all of our RGBS and SCART inputs a little more forgiving. Okay, now we flipped our board around, but let's zoom in just a little bit tighter so I can better explain what we're about to do. 
Now, when adding this 100 ohm resistor, I do this totally different than everybody else, and it's for good reason. It's more sensible to the circuit design, and it's also much cleaner. But basically, what we're going to do is we're going to look directly below these trim pots that we desoldered to this little array of Vs right here. Now, we're going to count over 1, 2, 3. Between via 3 and via 4, we're going to stuff a 100 ohm 0805 surface mount resistor between these two plated via through holes. That's all we're going to do. Let's go ahead and get our resistor ready. Let's just stuff it in there and let's tack it in on each side. Now we flex that up quite nicely and what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to slowly introduce my resistor approximately where I want it, which is about honestly right in here. Now I'm going to heat one side of the node and I'm going to join one side at a time. So here we go, one, two, three, let go. Perfect. Okay, let's move over to the left side. And just to make this a little easier on camera, because I can't see this so well, I'm going to go ahead and flex the other side once more. I'm going to take my tip and I'm just going to once again preload it just a bit. There's just a bead of flux on there. We're going to come to the left side and we're going to weld this right into place. Watch carefully. Just like that. And just like that, we're all finished with the RGBS stuff. Now again, this is only necessary if you ever intend to drive SCART inputs or RGBS into this device. Otherwise, you can skip this stuff, but we're finished. Let's flip this around and let's get to work on the power stuff so we can clean up the power and we can make this look amazing. Okay guys, let's do it. Now, we are going to be stacking our 10 microfarad capacitors on top of existing capacitors on the board. We're going to start with C23. We're going to get out one of our 10 microfarad units that I showed earlier. Let's zoom in and let's just get this done. It's really easy, guys. Let's do it. Now, we should have a pretty good view on C23. And to prep this, all I'm going to do is introduce on each side of the existing capacitor some fresh, clean solder, just like so. Now while holding this down, I'm going to bring my soldering iron in position and I'm going to solder one side just like that. Okay, let's flip it around and let's solder the other side and we'll do the remaining three capacitors. Now the next capacitor that we're going to do is C41. Let's go ahead and introduce some solder to each side of the capacitor that's already on there. Okay, now that looks pretty good. Now we're just going to take our solder and we're going to take our flux. We're going to flux C41 up. We're going to take our tweezers and we're going to grab our capacitor. And we're just going to lay it on top very carefully. Now this might get a little hasty might get a little tough because this is very difficult to do to keep everything in circuit and to keep everything in frame. It's very difficult to do this, but we're going to try it. So we're going to take our capacitor and we're just going to gently and carefully float this on top just like this. I think I can get a better angle if I do it like this. That's perfect. Okay, let's give this a shot. So here we go. One, two, three. Just like that. Beautiful. Let's rotate it around and let's do the other side. Now guys, I apologize for this angle. This is really, really hard to see because this heat sink in this package is right in the way, but I want to try to do this a little bit on camera. Let's hit this. Let's get it going. Perfect. Just like that. And it may look like it, but there is no bridging between that edge of the capacitor and the pins across or that little R28 right next to it. Now the next capacitor we'll be doing is C42. Same principles apply.
Now the final capacitor that we'll be adding additional capacitance to is C48. Let's get it finished. Great work, guys. And when you finish with all four caps, and again, I'm really sorry for those angles. This is really hard to shoot and solder simultaneously. Just tilt your board up so you can see that you clearly have good strong fillets on each side of these capacitors on each four caps. Now the next step is really simple. This LDO is prone to oscillating because this capacitor, C11, is undersized. The solution really is just to remove this cap and this LDO will be free of oscillation and you'll have a good clean rail output from it. Let's remove this capacitor and guys, as far as prep work goes, be pretty much done. Whoops, sorry guys, I misspoke. There are two remaining steps of preparation we need to do. If P6 is populated on your board, which it is in our case, it isn't always, but if it is, remove this. And also P8, we need to bridge across this to put this chip into a debug mode. Very simple. Let's go ahead and do that right now. Perfect job guys. Now we're ready to wire in our actual memory controller unit that will be pushing off the commands that will make the custom firmware work. Now I do this very differently than just about anybody else. We're going to mount this with the USB port facing the component ports just like this. And we're doing this for a couple of reasons. One, there's a nice ground plane on the back. So this is going to provide some isolation from the Wi-Fi signals that come and are dispersed from the actual ESP unit. And two, we can grab a couple of these signals in line and make this really easy to get to. So let's just go ahead and let's get this started. Now real quick, if we just take a look at our module, you can see that each signal is properly annotated so we clearly know what is what. The easiest way to get this started, in my opinion, is to come right here to the edge of the USB port and look here for this ground. It is right next to the three volt three supply this is the first thing that we're going to start with because this ground is actually, if we come up to our board, is going to interface directly to this ground via right here, just like this. So what you can do, if you feel inclined, is to hold this into approximate position and we're going to create a small solder bridge that will go across or you can use a conductor. Now for the sake of the hobbyist or the noob that doesn't have a great deal of soldering experience, what we'll do to make this just a little stronger and a little sturdy is we'll just feed a small 30 odd conductor through this via and through the via on the actual GBS board and we'll use that to make our solder structure that much more sound. Okay, let's get started and let's get this going. Now let's feed our conductor through the ground via of our actual module. And once we feed it through there, very easily, we'll just feed it through the ground via, just like this, of our GBS mainboard. It's very, very simple, not a big deal. Perfect. Now we're just going to make sure that that is fully through, which it is. And we're just going to line this up, line it up, line it up, line it up, just like that. Get it as close as you can, without touching, maybe a millimeter of space. And that looks just fine. So what we're going to do is we're just going to hold this with one finger, just like this. I'm going to come in here and I'm going to just apply some flux just like that. Now I'm going to take my tip and I'll try to do this on camera and explain this. But I'm going to take my tip and I'm going to be very generous and I'm going to load it up with a surplus amount of solder just like that. Now watch this guys. Hold the module with one hand. You see my left hand is holding this. Hold it quite vertically and make sure it's lined up down the way. It clearly is so we're going to come in here and we're going to introduce that solder and that flux and make contact with this one point. I'm going to let it go and I'm going to be very gentle. But just like that. And I'm going to trim this up just a little bit here. 
and cut off the excess just like that. Now this is not very strong yet and we're going to introduce some additional solder bridging but this is the exact result that we're looking for guys. Very very simple. Our module is now oriented vertically. It's out of the way. We don't have to keep it close to any of these sensitive electronics and this is just ideal especially if you're not putting this into some sort of special case where it has an, its own provision for this module to live in. Now there's another ground here that we're going to grab and just coincidentally it lines up just fine. We'll zoom into that. We don't need to feed a wire through this one but we'll go ahead and we'll bridge it together. Let's do it. Now from this point, it's really a walk in the park. We need to solder a conductor from one of the legs of this MTV and we need to bring it over to our development board. No problem. Let's just zoom in and let's do it to it. Now this conductor is going to route specifically into D6 and once again look at the annotations here we can clearly see that D6 is right in there. So we're going to route this wire in there, we're going to solder it up, and we're going to keep going. SCL or clock from the GBS needs to terminate directly into, oops, sorry, it gets blurry here, but we need to drive this into D1 of our development module. So let's go ahead and let's get that going. Guys, you're doing great. Keep this up and be patient and you'll be a winner every time. Okay. SDA, or the data pin from the GBS, which is right here, needs to connect to D2 of our MCU. So that's D0, that's D1, and D2 is right here. It's just three over. Let's get it connected. Okay guys, great work. Just one final conductor remains. We're going to grab power right here on this side of this diode and we're going to use a thicker 26 to 28 aug wire for this. We'll solder right here and we're going to bring this right up to the top and this pin that's labeled, sorry for the blurriness, VN. Bring it from the diode all the way up here and solder it in. This module will be completely wired in. Now guys, if you followed along this long, I am so proud of you. You've done a great job. This is the best way, in my opinion, to install this module. Now the way we did this has a few efficiency tricks. First of all, we directly interfaced our grounds from the main board to our grounds on our MCU, which means those are less wires that we have to physically wire in. Fantastic. Also. This module is now isolated somewhat from its Wi-Fi radiation in the sense that we have this nice ground plane here and that the Wi-Fi signal will more or less project out in this direction. This chip can be quite sensitive to that. So I see a lot of people take this chip and they'll either live it, they'll live it in here or they'll live it over there. That's bad news. This is much more ideal. And also, it doesn't take up any more real estate. This board is traditionally mounted away away from this device, if not over here in some way, in some place, and that just makes your form factor that much bigger. Also, I wouldn't recommend doing this, but it's quite strong and we're not using any adhesives or any glues. Having said that, this is all finished. 
the only thing remaining, other than a few other little simple tricks, is installing the clock generator that will give us great timings for all of our game consoles. Let's do that right now. Ooh. Now we're going to be working with our clock or signal generator. And what we need to do is we need to flip this upside down. And we need to insulate the lower half of this board. So everything under VIN 3.3 to 5 volts, we need to insulate. And you don't have to be super perfect about this, but I'm going to use Kapton tape. Now you can use electrical tape, you can use whatever sort of barrier you'd like to use, as long as it's electrically insulative and it covers the area. So let's go ahead and insulate this right now. Now we've insulated our clock generator and everything's in great shape. Now it's time to position this where we want it to live on our GBS. Now I'm actually going to use something that we make fun of a lot on this channel and that's hot glue. I'm going to affix this to the edge of the heat sink just like so with just a dab of hot glue to bodge it into place and this is where this little unit is going to live. Okay, let's do it. Guys, this is looking fantastic. Okay, let's begin soldering this in, and we'll begin with the most difficult pin, which is right here. We've got to solder a connection between the board here and this final pin on our video processor on this quad flat pack. So let's zoom in and let's get this nice and soldered into place. Great job. Now let's get power and ground to our clock generator and I'm going to grab ground right here on C41 on the edge of this capacitor and we're going to put it in a special place on the edge of a capacitor that's actually on the clock generator. Don't worry, I'll zoom into all of this and you'll be able to see everything that I'm doing. Okay, let's thicken up the gauge of our wire. Let's get our supply signals into our clock generator. Let's do it. Now that takes care of ground, let's go ahead and grab our positive voltage supply on the other side of this cap. Now we're going to be terminating that ground into this side of this capacitor right here on our clock generator. Let's just go ahead and tin that up a little bit and connect our ground. And we'll connect power right here on this pad that I'm tinning up right here. Now just two more wires remain and we'll be all done with the clock generator. We have to get data and clock signals from the actual clock generator here into our quad flat pack down here. Let's get it going. Now guys, we are all done. We have totally converted the stock GBS unit into a device that has the GBS control firmware. We have our clock generator installed. We have our MCU mounted beautifully, very strong. Don't do this, don't follow my example. But the point is, is 
this is all ready to go. Now there's one last thing that we can do. It's totally optional. Now, if you have one of these devices and you're going to digitize and convert the VGA output into an HDMI output for whatever device you're going to connect this to, this device requires a 5 volt supply. This is kind of a BS thing, but whatever. Can we fix this? Can we make this easy? Yes, we can. Every GBS comes with this little pigtail right here. Now what this does is this simply breaks out the 5 volt supply because we will be using a 5 volt adapter into a pigtail. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take and harvest the micro end of an SD or excuse me a USB cord. We're going to convert this so that we can have an interface for our HDMI DAC converter so it can connect right in here to our GBS so we don't have to have a secondary power supply. Let's do it. Let's strip this down and let's just quickly make this. It's optional but we might as well go ahead and get it done. Now as you can clearly tell, this USB cable that we've actually dissected is not a real data USB cable. This is actually just a charging cable which is perfect for us. Now traditionally, per the USB standard, these are color coded. Don't always follow this, buzz it out, but I know that this cable is up to spec. Here it is. Great job guys. Now if you ever need to use this VGA to digital HDMI converter, we have a simple loom here that we can use that will easily allow us to disconnect just like that and we can bring it right over here to the edge and we can connect it in just like that. And the length is appropriate so now we can just fold this down like so and we are off to the races. Great work. All right, guys, that's it. We're done with the hardware. Let's connect this bad boy with our 5 volt power supply. It's going to get on the network. Let's do some quick software configuration so we can integrate this and we can access the web server. And from there, we'll do a little test and we'll close it up. Let's do it. Now our GBS control is running. It's operational. The only thing remaining is to connect it to the Wi-Fi. So right now the GBS control is running in AP mode because it's not connected to our network. Now follow the wiki. This is very simple to do and I'll brief, briefly go through it but you guys should have no trouble doing this. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and click on the bottom right hand of my Windows desktop and as you can see GBS control is an SSID being broadcasted by the GBS control itself. So I'm going to go ahead and connect to this. Now it's going to ask you for a password. Once again, follow the wiki. It's right there. It's just the letter Q repeating, I think, four or five times. I'll just paste that in. Now this may take just a few moments because it's not going to detect, detect an internet connection, so it may take just a moment for it to connect. Okay, great. We're connected to the GBS control. We're now able to access the web server. Okay, I'm just going to open up a web browser here. I'm just going to navigate, per the wiki, to the address where this should be accessible. And wouldn't you know it, here it is. Now, there are so many great options to this, and if you want to connect this to your main Wi-Fi, you just have to go into the settings. It's not that big of a deal. Wi-Fi, it's currently in access point mode. STA will scan the network for SSIDs that are available, and you'll be able to connect to whatever you need to connect to that way. Okay, we're not going to do that. You can figure that part out on your own. 
here we go. All of these options are fantastic. You can set a pass-through mode, so we're only digitizing the native video coming through. You can set the resolution to 480, 1280 by 720, 1280 by 960, 1280 by 1024, and of course, 1920 by 1080. Another awesome feature with this, guys, is you can select presets and profiles for the SNES, Genesis, Neo Geo, whatever console you have, whatever specific parameters you want, you can set. There's so many great options here. There's so many things that we can do. You can automatically take the borders off. You can manually scale and zoom in the picture. This is great for uh, Game Boy Advance and Super Game Boy. Um, you can, I love cropping out the borders, especially for games like Seg uh, Sonic for the Sega Genesis. We can cut the overscan borders out. It's fantastic. Scan lines, intensity, line filtering, peaking, all of these things are amazing. But you know what? There's something else we need to do here. We don't have a case for this. Let's back out of this and let's see if there's something we can't do for that. Now the good news is I have designed a case for this unit in the current configuration that it's in. Now this case I designed to be wall mounted. As you can see you can either mount it horizontally here or vertically. You have two different sets of hooks and these small little registrations right in here are just so that you can put this against the wall. You can make your drilling marks and you can have precise anchor points for your screws. Now, of course, you don't have to mount this to the wall. I'm going to. I'm going to hide this behind my entertainment center, but nonetheless, you can just lay it flat and it wouldn't be a problem. Just like this. Let's get this off the printer, let's install it, and let's get it going. Fantastic job guys. We have our open face case all installed and ready to go. Of course this can live just fine resting on a surface. It has a nice separation between the main board and the actual bracketing itself and we will be mounting this to the wall. I'm not ready to do that yet but when I want to it's just a matter of plunking it on there. Okay let's hook up a system and let's really try this bad boy out and see what kind of picture quality we can really get. Holy crap, guys, check this out. This is amazing. It's, it's amazing, it's remarkable. $47 of materials and we have created a, a video processor designed for retro video games that is competing with devices that cost one, two, three hundred dollars. This is just crazy. The input latency is non-existent as far as I'm concerned. It is a fraction, a fraction of a frame. You're not gonna notice it. Color reproduction, everything looks fantastic. Mind you, of course, this isn't going to be as quite as sharp as an OSSC or even the RetroTINK 5X, but if you just take your nose three inches away from the screen, to me, it's almost imperceptible at normal viewing distance. It's amazing. It's amazing. This looks fantastic. Just check them go. Watch them go. Watch them go, Daddy. But watch this. Here's some really cool features. This is great. Watch this. All this blue overscan border, I want to log into the web interface and watch this. Gone. Let's see if we can't do the right side just a little bit here. Move the picture to the left. Just like that. And if I played with that a little bit more, I could perfectly get those borders gone. You've got absolute precise control. But guys, good lord. $47 of material, and we have made a retro gaming scaler that is just remarkable. Now, you guys wouldn't believe how good 480i content looks on this with its mo motion, its motion adaptive deinterlacer. It's fantastic. Um, yeah, but just, you know, a nice sample of uh, Sonic, and they're not going to look good. But why don't we go ahead and try to turn on those scan lines, even though we're outputting 1920 by 1080. It's not going to look good, but I just want to show you that it, in fact, works. Just like that. Now, obviously, these scan lines aren't going to be uniform, but scan line features, 
And I love this web interface. This is just remarkable. Okay, let's turn that off. And let's see if I can't get that magic jewel. Ooh. Well guys, I have to honestly say I'm, I'm truly taken aback by the GBSC firmware. It really does unbelievably amazing things for this device. Now, that's not to take anything away from the RetroTINK 5X or of course the OSSC. Both of these devices are still certainly worth every penny and they have their place rightfully at the top of the retro gaming video game processing echelon. Nonetheless, for $47, we built something that holds its own against these devices that can cost several hundred dollars. It's amazing. Now, I've been asked a few times already about this case because I shared it internally with a few friends if I'd be interested in selling it. I'm going to release these files for free so anybody can make this case. And for the people who don't have 3D printers, I'm also going to sell this eventually at a very low cost plus a little shipping. So I'm going to have this available on my store website at boltar.com. This will be available if you want it. Now guys, if you, if you like this video and if you like what I'm doing here, consider subscribing to my content and of course turn on those notifications. That's very important. I'm back. I've been producing content. I've been having a great time. And most importantly, above all, Rama, Robert Newman, the person responsible for this in its current state, he did this for free. So if you're going to take advantage of this excellent hardware, throw a few bucks his way. I want to provide a link right now to a donation page where you can give a few dollars just to say thank you. And you know what? We all should. I could never imagine doing anything for this community as much as some of these other people who really contribute. And they really inspire too. So I live up to them, I hope, in some regard. Nonetheless, guys, thanks so much. We'll catch you next time. Take it easy.